On today's show, it's another game, another win for the Cleveland Cavaliers, and Desire Smith gave them anything on a 10-day deal. We'll talk about all of that on a new episode of Locked on Cavs for Monday, February 12th. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster for free. Post your job at linkedin.com slash locked in MBA. That is linkedin.com slash locked in MBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. I am Chris Manning. That man over there is Evan Dameril. This is the Locked On Cavs podcast. Your look at the Cleveland Cavaliers. It is your team every day. Thanks again to Jake Stevens as always, for his work on production. Evan, Cavs-Raptors on Saturday is where we're going to start here. Another win for the Cleveland Cavaliers, another pretty dominant win, and also a win I think that stands out because it was so balanced. It wasn't a 30-something point Mitchell night. It wasn't one guy going off. It was a bazillion different players in double figures and contributing and, and providing a lot for this team over the course of this win. Yeah, that's really what it was for me. It was a collective team effort on offense. I believe eight players scored in double digits. Think off the top of my head. I know everyone who played yeah, scored eight. for the Cavs with Dean Wade or not. Dean Wade's the only Except one who for didn't Dean make a shot. So, yep. yeah, I mean, Dean Wade, I guess, is the anomaly in this one. But like, this was a collective effort for on offense and on defense, too. I think it is incredible to say that the Cavs are really just becoming a very elite team. I think that's just always a presence that has lingered with this team because it has gotten them to this point to begin with. But it took a little bit to click, especially with the new offensive focused additions in Struess and Yang, and just maybe figuring things out when you're dealing with so many injuries and players in and out of the rotation. But things are really starting to click for Cleveland. And it can't be understated. Like Scotty Barnes had a triple double in this game. And the Raptors pulled it within four in the second quarter, but then the Cavs just put their foot on the throat of the Raptors and just never looked back. Like this was a win that it could have been a loss. It could have been a surprise for Cleveland just because they are riding high and Toronto isn't that great. Like they could have underestimated their opponent, but these are the types of wins you see um, elite teams do. And also just like, it shows the Cavs are locked in and ready to go. And if they keep this up, they keep kind of grinding teams down defensively, holding them to under 100 points. Like they have been pretty consistently in this win streak. It's a, just a formula and recipe for success in this one. Like the the Cavs are just a very good defensive team. I know that's a hot take probably for some to hear, but you just also see like the two way connection between it as well. Like the defense translates the offense and then the offense translates back to the defense. Cause like the Cavs are able to, get up a shot very quickly or get a shot they like very quickly because they do play in the half quarter or also on fast break, but um, it allows them to get set on defense, just do it again on offense. Like it's a fun back and forth. And yeah, like JB has just done a very good job coaching up this team and um, giving them the ammo and equipment to ensure that nothing really phases them. And the fact that an opponent had a triple double and it didn't even matter, like that's crazy to me. Let me ask you this, as, as a, a win like this and the run they're on and the way that I th- everyone contributed in this win for the most part, do you, how much do you think the play style adjustments, the offensive changes, the shot changes, the, and just the buy-in I think we've seen the last month, how much do you think that makes something like this possible versus this was already there? I think it makes it a lot, a little bit more possible for Cleveland. Um, I just think the fact that they weren't rattled by losing Evan Mobley and Darius Garland like they did. And, you know, we're coming off a pretty ugly three game slide with the loss to Orlando and then two frustrating losses in Boston. Like the fact that they maintained their composure and started just digging themselves out of the hole that they kind of, or they did put themselves in to start the year and just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. Like, it's an interesting question, but I do think the new plays Dale plays a part in it because it does help keep some of those guys more engaged, whether it's Isaac Okoro, who's really thrilled or thrived rather from this faster 
and has been maintaining on offense because it allows him to get out in the fast break or just kind of do more damage on offense because he's getting good looks and also taking and making threes. It makes Jared Allen's life a little bit easier because Allen like, doesn't have to swim up the floor every single possession, but like he also gets a lot of second chance opportunities because the Cavs are spraying three pointers all over. They took 41 three pointers against Toronto and only made 14 of them. Um, but yeah, like that gives a lot of second chance opportunities to the bigs as well. Like I, I just think it is beneficial. And I, I, I'm more interested to kind of maybe pick the brains of people who have a better understanding of just watching the X's and O's than I do. But to me, just like it feels like there's a direct correlation of the Cavs playing this new offensive style that kind of complements the core identity that identity that's always been there. And it's kind of just the perfect harmony of what this team needs to be to be an elite squad in the NBA. I I tend to just disagree in, in this specific way. Kind of, I, I think a lot of what you said is true. The part I, I think I differ on is I think this run has just revealed something we did not know. There are basketball stylistic and X's and those things you could look at that I think tell a story here, and I think those are compelling. I just I think the most compelling story about what we found out is if you go back to how they lose in the playoffs, and then and what adversity there did to them, and, and how they got kind of viewed. How I the start of the year was choppy at best. You know, wasn't great. Garland, you know, wasn't good. Mobley was kind of bleh, and then it felt like the the bad was compounding with these injuries. It didn't feel like they had an identity. And then their backs get put against the wall. They face the biggest adversity they're probably going to face this entire season up in the, in the regular season, at least. And they found something that works. They found a new life. They found a new energy. They found a new spirit. Bickerstaff deserves credit. The players deserve credit. But I think this, I think the way that they have handled this as professionals, as a team, as people, as much as there is a basketball story you can tell, I think that sets the stage for a performance like this in Toronto, where like the Donovan Mitchell was still good, but he took 11 shots and he didn't need to take more than 11 shots. And how many times could you ever have said that? Evan Mobley and Jared Allen were the two leading shot takers in that game. Max Drews and Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell all had 11. A level of balance and just the team leaning itself in that direction and and it feeling so organic, it feeling so real. I don't think that was there until they went through this adversity and proved that they could actually get through that adversity. Yeah, I think you're not wrong on that just because this is a completely different team than last season. Um, and that's something you and I questioned quite a bit, especially when it was up and down and there were guys coming in and out of the lineup and it got to a point of just at least me watching, like saying like, okay, this team is still too talented to be struggling like this, even if they are missing Garland or Mitchell or Mobley or Allen at random points. And like you said, I think they did find something that is genuinely working. Um, I, I want to say, or believe at least this is always the offensive approach bigger staff kind of had in mind, but yeah, like you said, like Mitchell took 11 shots in this game, even when he didn't need to, but also, the, the Cavs hoisted up 41 three-pointers and they didn't need to, mm. but I think that's just kind of a product of the system. They are playing at a faster pace. They are putting up more shots. It's more... Uh, they're trying to find that balance between quantity and quality of the shots sometimes, but that is a that, that is an issue that you can keep ironing out with this new flow, but yeah, like the, the adversity they dealt and that they're handed to them, like they didn't let it deter them. It didn't let them phase them because that was a crossroads for them. Like it could have completely broken the season apart. JV Vickerstaff could not be coaching this team. Instead, it could be Dave Yeager instead of Yeager being on Doc Rivers staff. Like there is an alternate timeline where that happens. Maybe the Cavs make more of a dramatic trade at the deadline to maybe shock the core of this team and kind of reset a very talented group and convince Donovan Mitchell to stay. But it, everything has kind of just worked out very nicely for Cleveland. Like they've only lost twice in all of 2024 with January 1st against the Raptors. And then when they saw their win streak end against Milwaukee, uh, when they're up in Milwaukee for two games. So we talked about this on last week's show. Like we don't know maybe when they lose next, we'll see how they perform against Philly, which we'll talk about in a few. Um, but this is just a very interesting team. And I think the fact that it's kind of unprecedented and fascinating that they've completely changed their offensive style midway into the season like this and kind of just really have adapted and thrived is it's endearing. And I am fascinated to see 
what's next? Um, just because like we did see some good things from Darius Garland. It's encouraging. Like Evan Mobley's really playing well in this on offense. I think he's very engaged on both ends of the floor. I'm very curious to see like what the next step is. And I'm not like trying to be like a cynic here, but there is going to be another shoe that drops and is it going to be a good one? Or is it going to be another like step back, reset, reevaluate to kind of figure out where things are, especially if like they are very close to the postseason. I don't think it even has to be like good or bad necessarily. You know what? Let's, let's just continue this after the break. Yeah. Let's get into standings. We'll get into this one. We'll, cause there's frankly, I think a little less there's to not, say about not there's, a let there's, meat on the Philly. There is a, I would like to watch Isaac Accord defend Tyrese Maxey discourse. We will, we will have, but we'll come back and continue this conversation right after this. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn, if you need to hire, is the best way to do it. When you're hiring for your small business, you can find quality professionals right there for your role on LinkedIn Jobs. You have to check out LinkedIn Jobs for that reason. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team right now. And they know that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or the resources to hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that allows you to write your job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. 2.5 2.5 million. That's 2.5 million small businesses you linked in for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked in MBA. That is linkedin.com slash locked in MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So I, I, I don't even want to, for me, Evan, I don't even go to a place where it's good or bad. I, that's more, that, this is sort of an, as I'm in my like, doesn't matter where I am in my life era is this is what kind of influences how I'm answering this. I don't think things are always necessarily good or bad. I think they are sort of, they, they are, everything is sort of a lesson. And I certainly like outcomes can be good or bad and in and, and a results-based business like the NBA, that is true. But what I, th- I think there obviously will just be a challenge. The question is, what is that challenge? What does it come in the playoffs? What kind of opponent is it against? And to me, if we're if we're covering this team, if we're fans of this team, if it's the team itself, to me that's the exciting part. That is that is the exciting part about thinking about the Cavs because coming out of last year, and frankly part of this year, the conversation was what is going to happen with Donovan Mitchell? Mm-hmm. What is going to happen with this future? Is this team actually any going anywhere? That was the discourse. That was the the vibe. That now you're in a spot where you're saying, okay, what? They overcame a challenge. What's the next one? What does it tell us about them? To me, that's that's the exciting part about like this is where you want to be to some degree. Are you? Do I have them as like a bona fide title contender? I don't think I do. But is this team really good and in a really good position to exceed last year and and be on the and and push for something really interesting and overcome bigger challenges? One hundred percent. And that's where you want to be. Yeah, I one hundred percent agree. That's exactly where you want to be. And at least looking at the Donovan Mitchell question of it all. Um, if you're Cleveland and how well they're playing and also just how engaged he's remaining, you know, despite the fact that there is like the onus of what's he going to do next. Um, and sure, it, that's a question for this summer more than anything. But if you're Cleveland in the here and now, like you do have to feel a little better, at least about maybe your chances of bringing him back on some form of a contract just because of how well they're playing and how engaged he's, he is. And like the fact that, um, he is still actively providing input to Kobe Altman and his staff on the roster moves and decisions. Like it just became clear and transparent to me. It wasn't explicitly said, but clear to me, I should say that Mitchell was a guy that Altman approached about like what moves they need to make at the deadline. Cause he was a guy who said like, we're, we're fine. We really don't need to add anybody because everything's working so well for us right now. But yeah, like you have to feel good about Cleveland. Maybe some of that anxiety is relaxed and relieved a little bit. I know Joe Varden wrote about it at the athletic uh, over the weekend as well. And so, I'm just curious to see, I guess, more so what the next step is like, because there is going to be changes, improvements. Is it going to be more of like high qual, higher quality shots, less quantity stuff? Is it going to be more of the strength and numbers approach? Or are you going to see more of like a regression to the mean where the stars really pop and then the role players or maybe the high end role players all like Max Struess? Like 
their stats kind of take a step back. Like, is there going to be a down point, which there probably will be when things maybe kind of hit a bit of a roadblock for them. And it probably will come early in March when they either play the Knicks or the Celtics. But um, it's going to be interesting for me to keep evaluating this team because just based on where they're at mid December of 2023, I was not feeling great about the Cavs. And then looking ahead and like, trying to piece together like is this translatable for the postseason and the way that I watch them play and like it's so consistent and how like it's a fine-tuned machine yeah I'd say so because it also feels like yeah what's the next step of it are they showing their entire hand I don't think so I just think JB's coaching his tail off and the team is really responding to it but I wonder what the next gear or phase is so like they the, the, every NBA team doesn't have like 50 plus games worth of footage on the Cavs on how to like maybe pick apart some of the weaknesses and flaws and um, yeah, again, I keep saying curious, but I, I really want to know what the next step is for this team. Standings wise, before we get to just a quick look at the Philly game, Cleveland is in a really good spot as in, as the second seed right now. As we're recording this, Boston is playing Miami. So there, there's that in mind. But Cleveland right now is two full games ahead of the Bucks, who are the third seed right now. They are three full games ahead of the Knicks, and they are four and a half games ahead of Philly. <laughs> they are six and a half games ahead of the six seed of the Indiana Pacers. So, like, barring something unforeseen and insane, this team is, A, not at risk of being in the plane. They are just full-on in a great spot. And their odds of being the number two seed in the East feel pretty good. We, have to, well, we can look at some models later this week and kind of see, okay, well, how do you project this out and, and talk through that and what the value of that would be. Maybe that, I think that's a, g- a good conversation to have. But they're in a good spot right now, too. It, it'd be two or three and, and not four, which is a... Amazing spot to be. Our Cavs, Philly. I mean, let's just do one thing we're looking at. Uh, for me, I just want to see how... Th- Frankly, I just want to see if the Cavs can dominate this game. Philly's in a really weird spot right now. They've lost four in a row. Their defense well, they, since Joel Embiid has gone out is bad. They barely beat the Wizards Saturday Okay, so... so okay, so... Four, four, they're, they're they're one in five. Four, in four out of five. One in four. Four out of last five. five. Yeah, bad defensive team without Embiid. Not getting off... Not rebounding the ball at all. I haven't. I'm gonna see if there's a lineup from FanDuel yet. I don't. I doubt there is, just because we're we're a little. It's a little early as we're recording this. But this is a game the Cavs should just probably win pretty handily. Yeah, that's would, my one thing. Yeah, I think I don't think you're wrong in saying that. Like, I think this is a game that the Cavs should go in and take care of business. Just the Tyree Maxi factor is always going to be a question because Maxi has the propensity and ability to go off against the Cavs in the past and he could do it again but um it is weird to watch the Sixers because I was texting in front of the program Jordan Christmas about this um Nick Nurse has like not adapted at all to life without Joel Embiid on this team like for the first time in his life Nick Nurse has an elite big man and doesn't know what to do after the fact that elite big man's taken away from him after despite what he's done in his time in Toronto but yeah, this is a game where if you're Cleveland, I want to call it a trap game because Philly still has Tyrese Maxey as an all-star guard. Like they have a lot of good role players on that team still. Like, sure, the Buddy Heel acquisition makes them better firepower wise, and like Kelly Oubre is a, a pretty good signing for them cost wise and just what he is as a role player too. But like, they're throwing Paul Reed out there, who I believe is six seven off the top of my head. I'm gonna double check that as I talk. But like, Paul Reed is the starting center for the Sixers right now. Oh, he's six nine. Excuse me. So. If nice. you're the Cavs, like, yeah, nice. Um, if you're the Cavs, you got to exploit the size mismatch here and really, like, dominate on the interior, but it like, keeps sticking and rusting under laurels that the defense is what's carrying you more often than not the most nights. And you had mentioned it, like, Isaac Okoro is the X factor in this game. If you can turn Maxi's water off like he has against Damian Lillard several times this year already, like, just kind of that similar defensive performance against a high-end all-star guard, like, that's a pretty easy and clean path to the Cavs beating Philadelphia. For only the second time this season, which you know does have implications come playoff wise, with or without Embiid, there actually is a lineup uh, as of right now from our friend at FanDuel. Right now, Cavs are ten point favorites against the Sixers on Monday. That is a massive spread. They are minus five ten in the money line. Sixers are plus three ninety in the money line. The over under is at two twenty eight point five. So you can check those out now at FanDuel, but. That speaks to how wide of a gap this could be. Our Cavs Philly is Monday. We'll have a recap of that game and the latest Cavs updates for you on Tuesday. Coming up next, though, Cavs signed Zaire Smith to a 10-day deal. What could he bring 
And how does he compare to the other guys Clint has in the charge and has brought through the organization this season? That's up next. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have, have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventures to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. It has class-exclusive Google built in to the car. It is your always updating assistant on the call for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. There's also the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. It has room for up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity, and advanced capability by four. They have 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. So take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada. Why not just try all three, see which you like the best, and go on your next big adventure. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. So Zaire Smith, I think for people that aren't familiar with him, if you're gonna, if you're the Shaquille O'Neal to his Christian Wood, look up his story because it is a really unfortunate professional career for him. He's drafted in way back um, in 2018 and is traded to Philly in the Mikel Bridges deal. He gets compared to Kawhi Leonard by Brett Brown. Which sure, okay. I don't know why anyone needed to do that to him, but okay. He gets, has has to have a he has a Jones fracture in his foot as a rookie, and then later in his career, he never really gets anywhere. He ends up missing a couple seasons mm-hmm. with a scary allergic reaction. Yeah, and um, lost a bunch to, of weight to sesame seeds and a meal he ate. Um, and he had a hole in his he had a hole in his esophagus, which required. I'm just reading because uh, Jackson Flickinger did a feature on this, like six weeks in the hospital, and he went from 199 to 165, and then like he didn't get healthy. Like there's just something that kept holding him back during the pandemic, and like his quad just like was failing him, so like he just wasn't able to recover properly. He, you read the the Jackson story. There's a story at NBC about this. You can read as well. It's frankly scary and the fact that he's playing professional basketball again at all isn't a is an accomplishment he's only 24 years old he's lived the life of someone that is that is much older than 24 based on everything he has been through yeah he lived a life of hell and the fact that he's able to heck evan we're a heck we're a locked on we say heck we're not cutting that we're just gonna a, a life going. a life of turmoil and anguish like you said he is 24 and lived a life of suffering that is really tough and it's not just um the physical toll it took, it's probably, it, it's the mental language. It's just something he stressed to Jackson, but thankfully he had his faith and his family to surround himself with. But statistically and on the court, like he looks like he's healthy for the charge. He's been playing very well for them. I was frankly not surprised that the Cavs kind of gave him a call because he was a guy that was a training camp invite. It's kind of similar to like the Pete Nance situation. I doubt. He's not Smith play. plays very much unless it's garbage time. Like maybe if like the Cavs really do take it to Philly early in this one, he can make his technical Cavs debut against his uh, former team, um, which would be kind of interesting. But um, no, he's playing really well. Like he's, I'm gonna pull up his stats because I have the uh, Cavs our email and on my inbox here. He's averaging. 12.8 points, 4.4 rebounds, 1.6 assists, 1.3 steals, and he's hitting 40.4 percent three-point line in about 33 minutes per game. He started every game. He's 6'3", 205. He's a 2-3 type player, but he does kind of fit that mold. What could the Cavs kind of need more of? And yeah, the um, the Kawhi Leonard comparison is just super inappropriate. Like, it's always tough when you compare. To like all time grades because you're just setting them up for failure, especially if they don't succeed and especially out of their control times. But yeah, like it's it's a guy you're rooting for. Um, it's kind of similar to like Amani Bates with the charge as well. Like he is a story that has like gone through a lot of just stuff off the court and on the court, mm-hmm. some of it their own cause and a lot of it it's not. But 
Um, yeah, this is just like, yeah, it's a, it's a fun story. Plus, you know, the Cavs, like Kobe Altman told me this during his media availability, like they had until today or the day as we're recording February 11th to fill that 14th roster spot. Uh, this Smith signing gives them that 10 day window. And then I know after that, I, I, I have to double check the CBA, but, um, I'm pretty sure the Cavs can't keep like dragging this out and maybe they find a veteran to fill that spot and let Smith go back to the charge at that point. Cause I don't think he's two a eligible anymore, but um, yeah, he, uh, it's a fun story and you just hope he works out because he's showing signs that he's healthy and he has said multiple times he never thought he'd be able to play basketball again. So he's definitely not taking this opportunity for granted for sure. What I would, the only thing I, the only, I don't, you might be right about the two way thing. If there is a, they knew the, the Harry Giles, what is the so called Harry Giles rule, which allows the players who sit out an entire season to not have that year count towards their three year maximum service for tier eligibility. So he might actually be eligible for two way. You'd have, to, I, that's for lawyers to figure out. That's not for us to figure out. But like if theoretically, like the office too. Yeah. Like uh, there's someone in the league office who can interpret that rule and tell them if that's true or not. Regardless. He is here's the here's what I would just I would say he's a two three and that's that is not exactly what I think this team needs I, as far as like if you're developing guys certainly I think just like a lot to prove there's something to like about the, the way he plays at his size and and he's putting up good numbers in the G League and he's in 24 isn't old by any means he it's just that the, the what he is size wise, I think, is not exactly where I think they would l- think. I think would be the optimal thing to look at for that wing. If I'm like, and if I'm like looking at the guys that they've had come through through the charge this year, I'm gonna include Craig Porter there, although he's not played there, but he's on a two way. Mm-hmm. Amani Bates is in that list. Pete Nance is in that list. Isaiah Mobley would I would say like those are like the five. He's probably fourth to me, but like maybe third because Pete Nance is the only skill he seems to have is to shoot threes and is kind of struggles at everything else. Yeah, um, he can, he's not very athletic. He can rebound, but but he's you know. he had a he was like under five hundred on two pointers the other day in a G League game, which is really hard to do when you're six eleven, almost seven feet tall. Um, so maybe he's third, and I I would, but maybe he's a good two way option. Him, maybe it's him and Bates end up on two ways. And like, like maybe that's kind of where this ends up, and and with Mobley being the third, and I don't know if anyone is really optimistic about Mobley at this point. That Mobley yeah. at this point, at least. Um, yeah, the Isaiah Mobley thing is interesting, just because like, much longer the Cavs can keep doing this two-way song and dance before either he converts and comes over, or just you know, is he just like, an inch, I don't know. We'll have that conversation when the time comes when he um that decision has to be made this summer for Cleveland, but at least for me, like you said, Pete Nance didn't do much of anything with the Cavs. I think he like played in two games for them, uh, had average zero was across the board and had two shot attempts against the Hawks. But um, if at least for Smith and for Nance as well, I think this is just more of a litmus test for, or not a litmus test, but an evaluation and understanding for JB and his staff, just because like Nance and Smith were both training camp invites for the Cavs and um, they haven't, bit around them at all or really at all um since training camp and the reg- ended in the regular season began like i'm sure yeah i know like mike garrity is in constant communication with them i'm sure they have guys on the scouting department and just other members of the coaching staff that are evaluating charge players just to see like oh is this a guy we could call up perhaps but um this is just more so like a check-in for them too because like they do have shoot around they may have a practice between the Philly game and the Bulls game before after Chicago, they break for all star for several days, but um, we'll see what the, the next step and the next phases are for this, but yeah, it's just an evaluation. And I, I kind of disagree on this. Isn't what the Cavs need. I just think if they have more wing type players that have long, like I know he's shorter, but he has like incredible wingspan length. So if he can give you like some pretty okay defense, but mostly like three point shooting and like, it's just another guy you can have in the back clip. That's cheap and cost controlled. Like, yeah, go ahead and rock and roll with it. But yeah, you can never have too many wings. And also like, they just become tradable assets too. The more you have, like you can kind of be in that situation, like the heat were where you are like sell- selling off like Josh Richardson or um, Tyler Johnson, well, the, guys like they, that. And like, you still get like yeah, second I mean, round picks in return. And then you keep, 
developing it in assets. Yeah. The, the chugging acquisition of assets. You get, they, they got a little way to go, I think, before they're like pulling Duncan Robinson out of the Sioux Falls Sky Force and Haywood Highsmith and Max. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. The yes. Cavs are, yeah. yeah. Miami's yeah. Miami's undrafted in second round talent evaluation has always been elite. I mean, it, it gave the Cavs Max Struess in the end. So, um, after Struess didn't work out with the Bulls and I believe he was with another team before he ended up in Miami, but I know he started his career in Chicago. But, um, yeah, it's long story short, you hope Smith at least gets another shot at playing in the NBA. Um, a lot of these injuries were just like unfortunate out of their control, his control. And um, you just like, yeah, you just hope he has a puncher's chance. And if it's a Cleveland, that's cool. Then let's say he like he, he's able to put together some tape and garbage minutes for the Cavs. And it maybe intrigues another team to pick him up because he isn't a two way. So like, once that 10 day goes, he's technically a free agent playing for the charge again. Like that could be an opportunity for him to actually like an NBA team to join with on a permanent basis. Yeah. Would you have, would you, where would you put him in the, in like the list? Let's put Sam Merrill on that list as well, because he's kind of on the fringes, like fringe roster guys right now. Craig Porter, Bates, Zaire Smith, Sam Merrill, Isaiah Mobley, Pete Nance. Those six. How would you rank those six uh, as far Sam. as your optimism for, as far as your optimism for them? This year, and then as oh. like a prospect for the future, not just like right now. Question. Merrill, Merrill, Merrill's probably Merrill one takes you know, it runs. If you're saying right now, I'm like because he, yeah, because he, he, he plays 20 minutes he, a night. He's actually produced, and like none of the other guys. Craig Porter is like kind of produced, and then no one else has produced. Yeah, Craig Porter. Okay, long term prospects. I would say Craig Porter won. Amani Bates two, Sam Merrill three, Isaiah Mobley four, Zaire Smith five, Pete Nance six. Just because I'm not very like, I think it's a fun story, but I'm just not very high on the prospects when it comes to Pete Nance. So that's kind of my list. But like Merrill for me, like if it's right now, it's one. But like I just think on upside, like I think Craig Porter does get a bit of a shot. Like does kind of answer some of the questions or solve the issues that Cleveland has at backup point, which is something they've wrestled with since Darius Carlin became the de facto point guard. What about you? It's Craig Porter one. It's Imani Bates two. It's Sam Merrill three, even though he's older and that counts against him. We're the same so far. It's Zaire Smith four. Mm. Because I think he's at least like an NBA athlete. Like I, am I sure he's exactly the frame that I want for another wing? No, but like, I think he's at least like an athlete and is can shoot That's it fair. and like has a long wingspan. Like that to me is like what you said is the upside play to me for that. Um, then I get like then I don't like then I, it's I you could put you could you could put you could put Nance and Mobley in any order and you, I I would be like sure That's really fine. I I think I say Mobley gives you a little bit more juice than Pete Nance does. It's just been two years and it's like you don't hear. If Much. if there was ever a time where he was gonna like hang out with the main roster and like be around, probably would have been this year uh, when Damian Jones wasn't good and Tristan and Thompson got suspended for steroids. So that that's that to me just teams. I will say this a hundred bazillion times. Whatever executives and coaches say at press availability, there's often value in it. You can pick their brains and try to like ask them questions and tell you something. You can you can often get good information on it. We should have that access. You will learn more by what they do a lot of the times because their moves will tell you what they actually think and not what they're presenting in a certain way. Yeah. And when they no don't, one's ever gonna say, say no when, one's ever going to say anything's bad. So no, they're not going to be like Isaiah Mobley sucks. You know what I mean? Like we don't think he's good. But when he doesn't get a chance to come up when his brothers hurt, when Tristan Thompson gets a steroid suspension and Damian Jones was pretty bad. So at, least, at the very least untrustworthy and you're not going to just be like let's just try as a mobley and get some data on him that that to me tells you something i would agree i that that's a very good point you made there like does that tell you um where the cab's going what's going on with this team um or just more so on the development track and yeah who knows maybe isaiah ends up being like the sam merrill last year where like they signed him right before the playoffs and then he ends up sticking with the 15 man roster next year because i don't know what his uh 
rules are for two-way contracts either way the Cavs may have to make the hard choice of like keeping him or not after this year but I, I again that's a question for a front office executive I'd have to ask or me like trying to interpret the CBA as simply as possible all right let's end there I'm Chris Manning that's been Evan Damro. we'll be back on Tuesday Cavs Sixers is a tip in Cleveland, the second-to-last game before the All-Star break. They get the Bulls on Wednesday as well. We'll have those games and much more covered for you all this week. Thanks again to Jake Stevens. As always, have a great Monday, everyone. Enjoy the hoops and have a great day.